Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. Today, my guest is Tracy Flanagan, co-founder and vice president of J-Dog Brands with her husband, Jerry. Tracy has spent the last seven years growing the business into a national veteran brand. This is why it's so important to me to have people like Tracy on this. This is a brand about veteran services on every level. So, and her focus in particular is to develop the company's workforce development initiatives. Tracy, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me, Laura. So let me ask a little question. And I like to talk to to my guests, not just about what they do for work, but about who they are as people. You have a particular gift in addition to the work that you're doing with J-Dog. Tell us about that. My particular gift is dance. I do modern ballet and jazz and liturgical dance. I've been doing it for 40 years and I'm involved with a a community company out of Westchester, Pennsylvania called Westchester Dance Works. And there's five groups in that particular company organization. And I am point a part of their anointed group. So that's amazing. Yeah, it's been, it's very exciting. I've been doing that, I think seven years I've been with them. And I also take class there as well. So now part of why I think this is great is, I mean, dance is lovely. I like to dance as well. I think a lot of people out there are like to dance. I have no talent at it, but I do enjoy it. But In particular, because it's such a striking contrast to me for someone who does jazz and classical ballet and all these very high arts as as we, such refined art as we tend to think about it. But tell us about J-Dog. What is J-Dog Brands? J-Dog Brands is a national franchise system that awards franchises to military veterans and veteran family members exclusively, exclusively. So we have approximately close to 200 across the country, and they are a combination of junk removal and hauling franchises, and also our newly launched carpet cleaning division that was just launched April of last year. This is what I think is so fascinating about it, that I would never in a million years have put the two together, classical dance and junk removal as a national brand. That's amazing. So you really have to be quite the Renaissance woman to be able to uh, be a leader in both of those worlds at the same time. So let's dive into that a little bit, uh, in particular, the J-Dog brand. Uh, Where did the name J-Dog come from? J-Dog is actually my husband, Jerry's army nickname. He served in the army back in the 80s, late 80s. And back then he was called a 31 kilo was his MOS. What does that mean? It means that he was what is called a wire dog. He ran cable from tanks, so he set up communications. So it was called a signaler, but the nickname was Wire Dog, and his name was Jerry, so J-Dog. Got it. And so how did J-Dog, the wire communications layer army guy, turn into J-Dog Brands? It turned into J-Dog Brands because our vision, eventually, as we continue to grow the brand, is to have multiple services under the J-Dog umbrella. So whether it's junk removal and hauling, whether it is carpet cleaning, any other home service that we can provide um, under the J-Dog model and build it out the same way we did um, junk removal and carpet cleaning. And you built this company because your husband, after he came out of the army, employment was a challenge, as it is for so many veterans out there. Yes, it still is. It still is a challenge. There is still a disconnect between the private sector and the soft skills and leadership skills that our our veterans bring to um, the private sector in corporate America. Um, And it was also a way to provide for them just to control their own destiny. Um, We originally started to franchise, it was my idea. Um, My husband uh, kind of wanted to just build it out and be J-Dog junk removal and build out our whole territory. But with the downsize of the the, uh, military in 2012, we realized that we really had something very special, a special space for veterans and the military community. And we felt like we had a responsibility to offer it and do something about it and help. So that's why we decided to franchise. It's a simple business model. 
Um, it's very military-esque. We drive camo trucks. The big, the big dog is actually a rendition of the Fort Stewart Bulldog. Um, he has a hat on. Um, he's a star, you know, has stars on his hat and the, it's green camo and um, our guys wear, you know, camo pants and military boots and it's their very, uniform. Yeah. So definitely. And the customers really like it. They really trust a uh, veteran coming into their home and removing their junk or doing carpet cleaning. There's an automatic trust there. And I bet it also makes makes your customers feel like they're doing something good in return by supporting veterans. Yes, yes. We, we, we have found that nine times out of 10, a uh, consumer will choose a veteran brand over a civilian brand just for the support sake. That's terrific. So then the focus of, of our discussion today really is about the concept of influence and leadership. So as founder, as co-founder of this company, who do you need to influence? I need to influence potential candidates that come in for our discovery days. And I need candidates to being employees or being potential being franchisees or potential franchise owners. Okay. Um, and they're either military family member or they are military veterans. Um, and I need to influence our franchise owners that are out in the system. And I need to influence my staff that I run along with the president of our junk removal division. And I need to influence uh, women business owners and my JDOC spouses as well. Why women business owners? Just to let the women know that there's, there's a, a place for them out there, especially in our JDOC space. Our JDOC spouses, a lot of them are military spouses and they run, they run the business right alongside with their husband. So they are business owners, and I feel that um, I am able to share uh, knowledge, knowledge that I've learned and tricks along the trade um, to be able to speak to them and mentor them. That's terrific. Is there, um, so going, like you said, I, I think a crucial point that you touched on a few minutes ago is the discrepancy between what's considered good leadership communication in the military versus in the civilian world. And I hear that from so many clients when they're just even shifting industries or shifting companies within the same industry. You know, my old company, things were done this way. My new company, things are done that way. How direct are you supposed to be? How deferential? You know, are you allowed to question authority? Or are you allowed to pose challenges or, or anything like that? I would imagine that the contrast for going from the military where everything is so rigid and so structured and so hierarchical to this kind of ambiguous, non-formed American corporate world uh, must be really disorienting for a, lot of the, for a lot of veterans. It is disorienting for them. And we find that a lot of our veterans who have come and um, found us, uh, a lot of them have left corporate America or they've worked in corporate America. And the, the main, um, I would say, thing or issue that I hear from them is the fact that corporate America doesn't understand them. Hmm. Uh, How do they feel misunderstood? They do. Because what happens is you go into the military, into your military service, and you're a certain way. Um, you get, you're changed in there, forever changed, whether you have, see combat or not. Um, just the training that they go through. Um, when you come out, you're a completely different person. And it's very hard to take the military out of the military veteran and say, okay, well, now you need to be a civilian. And you need to, you know, mold yourself back to being a civilian and, and not think the way you did or, or talk the way you did or act the way you did in the military. Can you give an example of what's different? So how would you think, talk, or act in the military versus how are veterans expected to suddenly shift and think, talk, or act in civilian life? Well, sometimes when they go into corporate America, they're not necessarily, they don't necessarily understand what the mission is. They, and so they're-, they're And we're not talking about the company mission, we're talking about their job mission, is that their correct? Job mission, yeah. Okay. And veterans are very used to 
understanding, you know, what their purpose is, what their mission is, what they're trying to accomplish. And a lot of times there's so many layers in corporate America that, that they, they can't get those answers. So they often feel like they're kind of want, they're a wandering generality and they have very strong leadership skills that are typically not recognized. Um, their work ethic, they'll run through a wall. Um, and it, it's sometimes in corporate America, it's just not like that. And so they function very differently hmm. than, than just a regular civilian does. And, and it, in, it, I'm sorry, go ahead. And so I think what, I, what I've seen happening, the trend that is starting to happen um, in, in the HR world is uh, companies in their HR department are hiring veterans to be that liaison. Uh, to help the company understand the veteran, to put in maybe nice little uh, systems that would make the veteran feel comfortable, like like recognizing uh, the veterans on Veterans Day, doing something special for them, or um, you know a luncheon or or whatever it may be, just any way that they can recognize the veterans that are working, you know, within their company, and make them feel embraced, make them feel understood, and that's that's what I have seen that a lot of companies have done in their HR departments, which I think is so needed. Absolutely. Everybody needs to be understood. I think that's a fundamental uh, human principle. And one of, I find the most common challenges in getting people, especially when there's conflict of some sort, to be willing to listen to someone else is to feel like they've been listened to first. And it's, it's so challenging when you just don't feel understood. You're almost unwilling and unable to understand somebody else as a result. There, there has to be that, that step. So it's terrific that you're helping or companies and other organizations to be able to listen and understand the veterans better. And in particular, you're creating an environment in which they're inherently understood to begin okay. with. Yeah, they feel very embraced. And I've heard so many of our J-Dogs that have come to our Discovery Days and, and have been just blown away because they, they have said, I'm home. Mm. I'm home. So for people who are out there and listening and who are not part of J-Dog Brands, but perhaps you're working for a company, large or small, where you, there are veterans, maybe you don't know if there's veterans working for you. Do a little research, find out, because chances are that person would appreciate you reaching out. Just ask, inquire, learn something about them and see what they need or see who you can put them in touch with who might be able to help um, to the extent that we can all step in and do our role. I, I think that's critical. But now as part of the communication piece, it, in you yourself were a military spouse, but you were not military yourself, correct? I, I was not a military spouse. I married, I'm a veteran spouse because I married Jerry after his service. Got it, got it. So, yeah. Okay, so then in building this brand, what communication skills did you have to learn to, to get it off the ground and be successful? I had to learn to public speak. <laughs> um, I like, I like A lot of people out there can relate to that, military, veteran, or I, otherwise. I, you know, I had to be comfortable in, in a networking event, in a big crowd, being able to approach people, give them my card, speak about J-Dog. Um, I've, I've spoken on panels um, for veteran hiring and for women um, entrepreneurship. So I, I, I was really, really pushed um, out of my comfort zone. Um, I, I like to say that I, I can dance in front of a million people and can't speak in front of 10. I'd mm. rather not speak in front of 10. I'd rather dance in front of a million people. Um, wow. So, so that, that has been, that has been a hurdle for me that I've had to kind of get out of my comfort zone and, and really push myself. Um, the fact that I'm so passionate about veterans and what we're doing, um, I love what I do every day. So that has definitely helped me to push those boundaries. I've never understood entrepreneurs who don't love what they do, because if you don't love what you do, why are you doing it? <laughs> it's your company. So if you don't have the passion behind it, you're not long for this world at that point, because everybody else is going to feel it as well. And your clients and your people, yeah. you don't want people just showing up at best to punch a clock and cash a paycheck. It's, it doesn't bode well, to say the least. And when I've uh, done some speaking engagements, uh, both Jerry and I have done a like a fireside chat. And one of the main things that I say is you've got to love 
what you're doing. If you're going to go into on a business and be an entrepreneur, pick something that you're passionate about. Yes. I mean, there's many other reasons and steps along the way, but that has to be one because you're going to live, breathe, sleep your business for at least, I don't know, the first five years at least to launch it and get yourself out there. That is for sure. It is, it is an all-consuming endeavor to run your own company that way. Then what's a big mistake you made or a lesson that perhaps you had to learn the hard way on your way up? Mm. Well, I would say uh, a mistake, lesson learned. I think a do-over would, would okay. be appropriate. Great. Um, the early days of when we first uh, became national and um, had our HQ office and started hiring, um, you know, staff, we had some male military veterans. And one thing that I learned very quickly is that they had no respect for my position or my opinion. Because? Because of a, I was a woman, and in the military, as, as you get up and if, especially if you've been in for like 30 plus years mm -hmm. and you're something like a colonel, um, there's a sort of a little bit of a disrespect for women. Mm. Um, and so I, I found that a, a problem. And, and you weren't military I, yourself. I, I, I was not, I was right. not military. Right. Um, plus I, you know, I was a, a business owner. I had a business partner, which was my husband. Mm. However, not only am I his wife, but when I'm at work, I'm his business partner. And I'm the vice president and co-owner of this company. So that was very hard for them to grasp. And my do-over, what I would say, is I wished that I, that I was more confident in the beginning and speaking out more, recognizing my authority. Mm. And, and, and really embracing um, my position as the co-owner of the company. Um, I didn't do that in the beginning. I allowed myself to kind of be stepped on a little bit. And, mm -hmm. and there, was, there was strife and there was conflict there in the beginning. And I think if I had taken a different stance and a more authoritative stance, mind you, not you know, blasting them out of the water, but being very diplomatic, I think maybe I would have been taken more seriously. Sure. I think there's an important distinction to be made between being authoritative and being authoritarian, right? Authoritative is, is you know, this is what I, what I say goes and or at least this is my confidence and my understanding in my role and my position in what I need you to do as opposed to you'll do it because I said so and right. you know, the iron fist rule of the authoritarian regime, so to speak. Yeah, that, that is, is definitely not the approach to take. Right. So. But you did need to step up to the authority at least. Yep. And I needed to be confident and, Absolutely. and, and be confident in understanding my position. And mind you, it was a new position because we hadn't been on a national level. It had just been Jerry and I being business owners together and right. running our own shop. So this was thrust me into a whole new situation that I really had to uh, understand and, and, come to terms with and kind of make it my own, so to speak. So you've, you've taken this from a small, just two person business to a national franchise. What's next? What next? Um, I would say I really am kind of forging ahead into the military versus veteran spouse space. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do some research there and figure that out because I'm sure there are a lot of women like myself, um, that are veteran spouses, and uh, they married their husband after service. Hmm. However, they may have married a, a combat veteran that struggles, and they don't, I believe that they don't really have the resources to hmm. understand the struggle that the military spouses do. The military spouse community is huge, and there's a lot of resources there. Um, and I don't, I don't believe that the veteran spouse space is that talked about very much. So, so what would you be doing with them? Would you be creating? A I would be trying to um, find veteran spouse organizations and resources and, and how 
um, I can leverage that and, and help other veteran spouses. Um, maybe a J-Dog nonprofit arm of some sort? Something, or maybe it could, you know, I'm also, I also sit on the board of our foundation and- um, our, Tell us about the J-Dog Foundation. What's the general principle? The general principle and our mission of our foundation is veteran and active duty veteran uh, suicide. Oh, um, wow. And preventing it. And also um, tools to help manage PTSD. If you manage PTSD, a lot of times you can prevent the suicide. So that could be another arm of, of, of our foundation going forward. Right, right. Um, and I, I, and I, I guess I, you know, I welcome opportunities like you've given me here, podcasts, and just being able to continue to get out there and, and practice my public speaking and just <laughs> continue to do it. Um, and, you know, again, trying to meet other, you know, women business owners and entrepreneurs and, and telling them my story of how I started J-Dog and, and how to start a business, do a startup. And just to clarify, J-Dog is not strictly a women's business. This is for, the, for military veterans, yeah. families, men or women, whether the spouse is male or female is, is not relevant. This is yes. your, your current passion is also recognizing the need that military and or veteran spouses who are female have as an additional layer yeah. of challenge and looking to, to, to support that group as well. Uh, and I'm glad to be able to support both that aspect as well as J-Dog and all the veterans who are out there as well. So if I can give a voice to you who can give a voice to them, then we all do our part. So Great. from there, thinking about everything we just shared and the importance of, of who you've needed to influence and how you've stepped into your power, stepped into your role, I want to ask you or invite you to offer the listeners a 24-hour influence challenge. This is the influence of the day. So what is one step, one single act that our listeners can take and complete within the next 24 hours to help themselves have greater influence? My 24-hour challenge is your 30-second elevator pitch. Hmm, tell me why. Do you have one, number one? Do you have okay. one? And if so, how can you perfect it? Because when you meet somebody for the first time, be it a networking vet or doing something like this, you should have exactly down pat what you do and how to make people like say, wow, hmm. in 20 seconds or within that 30 second elevator pitch. It's something that you can engage somebody immediately. It's so critical. And it's, I'm always amazed at how many clients I work with where somehow in the course of whether we work together for, you know, a full day or for a year, uh, where that comes in, how many people need help with that. You've been doing what you've been doing for so long or you, and you're so good at it, but you can't explain it quickly and easily in a way that people can wrap their heads around. And I, I often hear two challenges with that. And you can tell me if this sounds familiar. Number one, people spend too much time talking about the tasks that they complete, which is not particularly inspiring. If, if you meet up with the CEO of your company in an elevator and he says, what do you do? You don't want to tell him how many boxes you check in the day. You need to explain the value that you provide, the benefit of your service, how you help the company uh, be, a, be better at that point. Um, and an awful lot of people, depending on the nature of their role, are a little self-conscious and I'll hear the word just come in like, well, I'm just an accountant or I'm just in IT, uh, just a developer or something. And I, there's no just, there's no just take pride in what you do. Show me that you love what you do and that you feel like it's creating value for the company in whatever capacity. Do you find that veterans and, and others have a hard have, have a hard time expressing that as well? Yes, I think they do. In fact, we have a whole class in our J-Dog University love that, it. that teaches the 30 second elevator pitch. Nice. So, um, because they need to get out there as J dogs and be able to talk to the customer, be able to engage and market. That's part of their marketing is yes. they need to be able to talk to somebody in the grocery store or whatever and, you know, wear the brand, be the brand. Okay. And be able to talk to people about what you're doing right. and who you are and what your mission is. Terrific. All right, everybody, you've got your marching orders. Go out there and get your 30-second elevator pitch down. 
Now, we've talked about your trajectory and moving up and building your company, but I want to talk for a minute now, changing the direction into some insights into succession planning, career advancement, and who you oversee. So the first topic that a lot of people talk about in my world is the notion of executive presence, which in the military, I believe, is referred more to as command presence. Correct. How do you recognize it in others? What does it look like to you? (laughs) Well, this is going to sound kind of funny, but I actually live and work with it every day. Executive presence, my husband is the king of it. Um, and he, thankfully he's, I, I'm a little sponge. He's rubbed off on me (laughs) because again, I have trouble with public speaking and I'm a little shy. So, um, well, you'd never know it here. (laughs) So basically it's someone who, you know, you're dressed to the nines, you're dressed professionally and you're somebody who can just literally walk into the room with a confidence exuding out of you. And you're able to talk to people in such a way that they just want to listen. And I, I watch this happen all the time. And so you, you want to be that type of engaging type of person. And you don't have to be in a tuxedo and you don't have to be six foot four and 280 pounds of solid rock to have that. Do you? No, you don't. No, you don't. It's all in how you carry yourself. And your diplomacy and, and confidence. And with confidence, I like to say, fake it until you make it. it like, sure. if, you're not, if you're not confident, just fake it. Act like you're confident. You certainly can't fly the flag that says, I'm scared. Right. No, you cannot. So you have to fake it until you make it. And eventually, you know, you'll get better at it. You'll get better at it as time goes along. It's happened to me. Now, as... as since J-Dog is a franchise organization with regard to the junk removal and the carpets, et cetera, when you're not just looking for employees, you're looking for franchisees. So in trying to determine who would be a good candidate for this, what are the three most important communication skills that you look for in them? One skill that, again, the word confidence and sure. presence, okay? Okay. Um, we're looking for someone who will live by like our motto, Mm -hmm. which is respect, integrity, and trust. Um, Strong communication skills. You need to be able to speak to people. You need to be able to be confident. You need to be able to approach people because you're going to be dealing with customers. You're going to be marketing. You're going to be going to chamber events, B&I events, which, you know, are networking events. Mm -hmm. You, you know, it's a referral network. You talk about your business. You need to be able to do that. If you can't, that's a huge problem. Okay. And then with regard to managing up, which is something we often hear at least more in in corporate and and larger organization world around in all different industries, when, when your direct reports, either your employees or your franchisees have to present information up to you as the boss, what do you wish they would all do more or do less for that matter? Well, we deal with the field um, often. Our operations team does and, and Jerry and I do um, as well. And there are, are two things that we really wish our franchisee would, would do. Number one is we wish they would do what we taught them to do in and when they came to j University, we wish they would follow the system. You wouldn't be surprised of how many franchisees and franchise organizations, I think, all struggle with this to a certain degree. You give them the playbook, it's, at, that's, it's, it's business in a box when you're looking at the franchise system. It's, it's tried and true, it's a proven business model if you're franchising, and it works if you follow the template that you're given. You wouldn't believe, we have people that just go off the path and they forget what they learned and then they try to figure it out by themselves. That's number one. Number two is a lot of- Number one is don't don't break the rules and try to, if something works, don't leave out one of the ingredients in the cake and then complain that the cake doesn't taste right. Correct. Okay. Exactly. (laughs) I'm all about food. Go ahead. Well, and the next thing is, is call us if you're struggling. If, you know, I think- a lot, some of our franchises are afraid to pick up the phone and say, mm. 
hey, uh, the phones aren't ringing or this doesn't work or, or I don't know how to do this job or call us. That's what we're here for. And we, we can't, we stress this so much in our JDOG University. Our whole entire staff in this office, which is 12 of us, including Jerry and myself, we see, we, we are here for you. We are your source. We are your resource, your mentor. Your, we have the information. We have everything you need to be successful. Call us. We want you to call us. <laughs> so be proactive. Let me know when, you're, when you need help so we can help you out of it rather than waiting until you're so far in the hole that we can't help you anymore. That's right. That's right. So a little bit, get that ego out of the way, get that pride uh, so that you're not afraid to ask for help, get the help that you need. Correct. Okay. Now this brings us to our... Uh, to our speed round. And in this speed round, we're going to address just a couple of issues that I'm constantly hearing from clients, whether we're doing one-on-one -on -one coaching, whether I'm training a team, even when I'm, I'm speaking at conferences and things, these are the kinds of issues that perpetually come up in Q&As. So now you mentioned that as far as public speaking is concerned, this was not your love by any stretch of the imagination, but you've learned how to do it. So could you give us one tip for managing nerves and speaking with confidence, even when you don't feel it? Well, again, fake it till you make it confidence. But also I think if you organize mm -hmm. and kind of prepare and take notes or what, whatever helps you to visually remember um, in your mind of what you're going to say um, and practice and also know your material, know yeah. your material. And there's a lot of difference, a lot of gray between winging it and memorizing things. And I think a lot of people feel like, well, I don't want to memorize, but if I don't, then it's not going to be perfect. And right. practice doesn't have to mean rote memorization, but that preparation really is key. Yeah. Okay. So what about the idea? Now, now maybe this correlates for you, but it doesn't necessarily correlate for everybody. Would you consider yourself an introvert or an extrovert or somewhere in between? Uh, I would definitely say that I'm in between. Okay. Um, I am shy by nature or used to be. I will, I will say used to be. Okay. Because J-Dog has... Um, Whipped that out of you, huh? Yeah, it's changed me. It's, 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 again, it's taken me out of my comfort zone and mm -hmm. has taken me down new roads and new pathways. Um, if, if, if I, 10 years ago, if you would have told me that I'd be doing the things that I'm doing right now, I would have said, you're crazy. I don't want <laughs> public speak. I don't, you know, I don't go on live Fox with, uh, Maria in the morning and <laughs> interview. I don't, but I did. Um, so, so with that balance, then can you tell me one strength that you feel like comes from your particular balance of intro and extra version, and then one area that you realize, well, I think for growth, you just told us that you, public speaking is something you really had to work on. What's a natural strength that comes from that? Strength is once I start talking about J-Dog, just everything comes out. I, I'm very passionate about it. I love talking about J-Dog. Um, I have a lot to say. So I think that that's definitely a strength. And once I get going, you know, I feel comfortable. I feel relaxed. I'm, you know, I'm in, I'm in J dog zone world and it, it's all good. Absolutely. Is there, um, I think that's something that people struggle with often is being able to identify something that they're good at and figure out how to leverage that into the strength as well. Finding that passion can then make the challenge of speaking in public or whatever other challenge you're having a little bit easier to handle. When you love it, it, it just makes everything easier. It is definitely easier. Now, what about conflict? Because handling conflict is a critical skill for any leader of, of any level, of any kind of organization. And most people, regardless of what their business or their job requires, are hardwired for a reflex, either a fight or flight. Are you an avoider? Are you a uh, someone who just wants to go in, address it head on and take care of it. What's your natural instinct? Kind of fight, flight, freeze? Well, now I would say I'm fight, but um, many years ago, I used to be a flight person. I hated conflict. I was not confident in, in, in saying I have a problem and let's talk about it. But I think being in, in my role and, and having everything you know, evolve and developed, I've, I've learned that communication is so key, especially when you are dealing with 
coworkers and and people and staff that are underneath of you. Um, uh, so I would say, I mean, I think it depends on the person. When I want to fight with my business partner, <laughs> um, you know, I, I can kind of be me a little bit. But when I'm when I'm talking about coworkers or staff, there's definitely um, a certain amount of diplomacy. You really have to, um, you know, take a diplomatic approach. And a lot of times I have to just, you know, because I, I, I get really upset and I just have to take a couple of deep breaths and, and just I, ha I stop myself to think, okay, I need to approach this in a diplomatic way. How am I going to do that? And I do it. We have a conversation. I listen to them. They listen to me. Um, and it's very communicative. And I think the next, the third thing would be that eventually have, have an end state of the debate, whatever mm -hmm. the argument is or whatever the problem, what's the end, what's the end state that you see happening in your mind and, and what an end state, I think, I mean, the compromise, what are you willing to compromise? Gotcha. So if you, if you kind of go in it with all of that, I think it, it, it kind of helps the communication, the transparency kind of um, lends itself to an open discussion. And then, you know, you can come up with that. Well, how about if we handle it this way? Or I'll give you a chance to try it your way in two weeks time. If it's not working, you need to do it this way. Something like that as an example. Tracy, thank you so much for joining me today and for sharing your experiences and your trajectory, your path with J-Dog Brands. Is there, how can people learn more about you and J-Dog? You can go to jdogbrands.com and on that website, it's our junk removal division, our carpet division. You can find out about owning a franchise. Also, there's links to our foundation, uh, which will take you to that website and you can learn about what our foundation is doing. And Laura, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I loved um, being able to share J-Dog with you and with your listeners. Well, I'm sure they got as much out of it as I did. I always feel, um, it's funny, I'm, I'm not in the military. I'm not doing a whole lot the, the way I wish I could, but I always feel good when I get to talk to military families, um, veterans themselves, and just hear and understand if nothing else, being able to give them the gift of my trying to understand, I think is, is a step that we can all afford to take. And yeah. probably should do more often. So thank you. And please thank Jerry for his service as well. Thank you, Laura. And to everybody else out there, thank you so much for tuning in. If you want to download my quick start guide to mastering the three C's, command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe so that you don't miss any additional, uh, any other of our episodes moving forward. You're listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Scola, your host, and I look forward to seeing you again next time. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Laura Sicola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.